Time to zoom in now with the great man himself, the number 35. Great to have him on K-Rock Football, our Cat Attack podcast, which now we're doing uh, with my ugly mug that you can see. But uh, a very attractive man himself with a wonderful moustache just going over the top lip there. A very good afternoon, Patrick Dangerfield. How are you? Good, Kingy. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate your time. Uh, I'm not going to ask you boring, generic questions about what have you been doing in lockdown and how have you been keeping fit. I actually want to start with when you got given the little contract to sign to say that you'd be president of the AFL Players Association, <laughs> did, you, did you read the fine print that says, may have to lead association through global pandemic? Um, I'll clear this up now, Kingy. Um, it was a short straw that I got, not a contract. Um, and I drew it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a, um, a very challenging sort of, uh, you know, six, seven weeks. For everyone, and then if you're obviously involved in any sort of industry that has the potential to to start up during it, which the AFL is clearly one of those, um, yeah, anyone uh, in that position is in for a bit of a challenging time. And and you know, with the stake the players having the game, where um, you know, as representatives of that, we have a, a challenges ahead of us as well. So I think we've worked through those uh, reasonably well so far, and the AFL have been great. And, um, Still a few stumbling, a few hurdles to, to get through with obviously returning to play. But um, yeah, there's a bit at hand still. Yep. You and Paul Marsh essentially are the, the face and the voice of the, the PA and have been through all of this. How hard is it for, for you to switch off at night and be able to put your head on the pillow and get a, a decent night's sleep? Or is that hard to, to make that sort of switch and just flick it to be able to, I suppose, not have a, a thousand scenarios rolling through your head? It just depends when it is, to be honest. I mean, the, the week um, post round one, well, the week leading into round one was, was hectic enough and then things sort of really stepped up the following week. So that, that was a sort of a two-week block there that was, um, that was incredibly taxing for, for all AFL staff um, and certainly our PA staff who did a, and have done a wonderful job. But yeah, the, there's certainly sleepless nights then because, um, you know, you're working through... The, the different stakeholders, your own players, where they sit, trying to do what's best for um, you know, the, the game, balancing that up, balancing up our um, responsibility to the players to do the best thing for them and, and you know, fight for the, the best working conditions and all that sort of thing. So, you know, that was a, um, that was a really interesting process to go through and certainly a, a really valuable lesson. And, and now we'll... Um, you know, we're going through it again with return to play, how that looks, if it's a hub model, how does that potentially look? So there's a few sleepless nights here and there, but the, I've certainly got to, the, the work that our PA staff has done, I've just got to commend our exec team and, and everyone that's been involved with, you know, working with Gil and the, and the rest of his um, team in, you know, finding ways through it all and working through that sort of discussion process around, Player payments now into obviously return to play, how that looks and could potentially look. Yep. Do you feel sometimes you were just on a hiding to nothing when you were asked to give a view, and you know, obviously you found pushback not only in the industry but from from fans and uh, from you know just the the general community. Yeah, I mean it's it's one of those things that um, you know everything everyone's going through a torrid time at the moment, so. Um, you know, the frustration for a lot of people is taken out on those that have the opportunity to actually fight for what they've got. Um, and that was, you know, that was our ability as a, as a players association to really work with the AFL. We could actually stand up for what we believe in and, and, and work through a process that could benefit both players and the code. And, um, you know, some, some people and, and fans obviously found that difficult process, but if you've got the ability to, um, you know, to represent your members and have a, a say, then that's our responsibility as a as an association. Yep. How did you deal with players individually, Patrick? Did you uh, reach out to many yourself, or uh, I'm guessing each does each club sort of ha have a, a representative on the PA? And do you deal directly with them? So you're dealing with you know 17 or you know I don't know whether Geelong has one aside from you, but dealing with them individually to I suppose filter the message through through that almost shop steward. Yeah, we have every club's got um, at least one delegate. Most have two delegates. 
we have a conference um, every year, generally in December, where we all come together and, um, you know, workshop and collate different info that we've sort of gathered of, of, through our experiences, um, workshop how the year might potentially unfold, what we've got to look forward to, little, um, little challenges that lay ahead of us. So um, most of it's, it's done in those sort of, at the moment, obviously there have been Zoom meetings. We have an exec board um, as well with, with male and female players that um, are all part of that. So they're the ones that really provide the, the guidance, if you will, for, um, for the PA as a business itself. Um, and then more broadly, the last few weeks we've sort of had different times where we've had Zoom catch up with uh, Zoom catch ups with the captains, um, and just start updating them um, with where things are at and around sort of worst case scenario on on hubs. And, and at the moment, obviously, it looks like um, it's going to be an altered version where you know the potential to fly and fly out of each state, depending on border regulations and restrictions. Um, you know, hopefully, it's not going to be the whole of the AFL. Um, it's picked up and moved because obviously it's a really costly process and um, length of time and all that that's been up for debate. Yep. Who's the most vocal of the captains? Who's really had a, a say at the the table? Um, oh, to be honest, it's it's always very vocal, um, and that's what you want it to be. You want it to be an environment where people can stand up and um, voice their opinion and and, and be heard. So um, whether it's you know return to play or um, the hub scenario or in previous years it's been CBA negotiations we try and set up an environment that's comfortable enough for everyone to um, you know stand up have their say be heard and, and really throw it out in debate so um, it's always really vocal which I think is a really good thing you know you don't want to you don't want to set up these meetings and then uh, and then have no one speak and no one feel comfortable enough to speak so everyone's pretty vocal. Yep. Does the uh, Geelong skipper say much? Uh, well, he's got a bit of an inside word because obviously I sort of sit throughout uh, different board discussions. So he's sort of always generally, um, you know, well updated. Yep. Take, take a sip. I'll think of my next question. How have it's you... actually juice. It's not tea, unfortunately. Oh, what do you got? What's your concoction? No, nah, it's just orange juice. It was what was, it was, what was there because I was escaping the children to come up here and talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, had you ever heard of Zoom before all of this? Uh, very briefly, but geez, I know it well now. <laughs> is it going to change? Well, not just, I, I suppose not just Zoom, but things are going to change. Football's going to look very different post this and we may never, well, we won't see football looking the way it did prior to round one, 2020. No, we won't. And, and yes, I, I 100% things will change around broadcast accessibility to players. I think as tech gets better, clearly it's an opportunity to be able to um, get access to players that usually it's obviously difficult and you'd certainly find this just lining up schedules with everyone to fit mm. the beauty of, of tech improving. Um, and we've really been forced in, into this position, as you said, to just find a way to, to make it work and to conduct interviews or, or meetings or whatever it might be. So I think it, it will change the face of the media landscape to a certain extent. It will change player access, hopefully for the better. Um, and hopefully we'll, it means we get more of an insight into players and you know what they do and what makes them tick and um, you know show show different different sides. You know when you're interviewing in a in a situation like this, clearly players the majority of them they're going to be at home, so they're in a more uncomfortable environment, and you might you know potentially be able to delve a bit deeper and and get to know them a bit better. So yeah, I think it, it certainly changes the the face of the media landscape. Clearly the spend on it is going to change and we've, you know, everyone's been hit hard, whether you're a local business or big business. So that's going to change the look of footy as well. Yeah, absolutely. Will it change too? I suspect you live down at Moggs Creek and that's where life is for you that some of the meetings being part of the leadership group that you're part of that now, instead of having to come into the club for, or having to stick around at the club for that, they can be scheduled that you can get home, make yourself comfortable. And, you know, instead of the, the leadership group of five or six and, and Scotty sitting around a table, you're, you're sitting with a coffee in hand at home and knowing that, you know, you don't have that 45 to one hour drive back down. Yeah, certainly. I, I think with, with how we, and, you know, very much what we're talking about now is speculation when it comes to return to play and how, how that looks, contact time. Um, I suspect if we are to return to sort of a, that sort of 
block of eight to 10 players per training hub, if you will. Um, it'd be train and then disband and, and go separate ways and, you know, try and fit in gym somewhere if you can. But once again, it's in smaller groups and certainly you're not going to meet in large groups. So once again, it's via Zoom. So, um, yeah, I dare say leadership meetings will go the same way. Ours are always pretty pretty fluid and pretty relaxed anyway. We don't like to um, you know, meet any longer than we have to. Otherwise, you end up talking about the same things and, and stuff that isn't relevant. So ours are always pretty, pretty pointed, which I think is important. Yep. Uh, Hawkins and Duncan have been a combination. Uh, I believe Fort and Atkins have worked together. Stanley and Tui, who's Dangerfield's partner been? Uh, I've mixed it up a little bit, to be honest. I've sort of done a bit of training with Josh Jenkins in the last few weeks and then uh, Joel at different stages, a few of our young guys as well. So, um, yeah, it's sort of who who I can sort of um, convince to travel down the road and, and train at, at local ovals around the surf coast versus having to drive in and, uh, you know, train at St Mary's or um, Queen's Park. Have you got a favourite down on the coast that you like going to? I do, but I, I have to sort of keep those locations uh, undisclosed, King. <laughs> Surely you get down to Anglesey and uh, try and avoid the brew poo. Nah, no comment, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that they've been wheeling out the Between Two Cats interviews again on the uh, Geelong website? Yeah, I have, and uh, geez, you do some stupid things at times, don't you? Well, I certainly do. <laughs> uh, your best line did come out with the Joel Selwood one, and I don't think anything will top about him lacking a tan because he'd been living in your shadow for 18 months. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what was I thinking? Who put me up to that? It might have been Scoot, I reckon. And He's I think that interview actually... Generally happy to take the piss out of his brother. <laughs> that, that interview started with, I think, Scott Selwood as the the name graphic and then got changed to Joel uh, very That's quickly. That's right, yes. Yeah. So, um, that, <laughs> and the jacket that you wore was just d- divine. Yeah, it's... Uh, nah, actually, it's not in your wardrobe. Don't know where we found that. <laughs> Local op Well, you gotta you gotta have some fun with it. I think that's yeah, you gotta have fun with what you do and how you've sort of engaged in different things for at the media, whether it's club based or um local or, or, or more national. Um I think we at different stages as players you sort of become a bit gun shy because um you have different different people from those in the media looking for stories and yep. but you still have have a bit of fun with it and enjoy it where you can. You've got, obviously, players with personality like yourself. And every player's got a personality, but some just seem don't feel like, well, gee, if I put my head up, I'm going to get it stomped on by somebody because I'm having an opinion. You know, Acker obviously was one that we've, you know, got pillared for you know, being not even different, but just wanting to say something and provide a bit of, bit of colour. Somebody like yourself can do that and, and very comfortable in your own skin. How do you get players, though, that have got really good personality, but maybe not comfortable to, I suppose, come out of their shell? Yeah, I think it's, and it's different for everyone. Some are interested in the media and, um, you know, a potential path down, down that way. And some just aren't. Some just, it's just part of what they have to do as a league footballer. So they do the requirements and then, and then that's it. I look at someone like sort of a Jordan Clark, who, who is quite interested in the media and he's really, he's very, very good. He's done a few little hosting um, gigs for the club so far when we've had family days and um, I've had convos with him around you've got so many people in the industry that clearly are media based and, and are willing to help out and um, and help improve you and, and the skill set that it takes to either host or um, interview and those sorts of things so it just depends whether you're interested in it or not if you're not when it, you know you never force anyone into something they're not comfortable with doing um, but I think the, the players that, that get drafted into the game now, um, they're pretty good at it because they've, they've been exposed at a, at a younger age than um, certainly I was when I was first coming through. So um, they're well-versed in answering questions or not answering questions um, and, and understand it's just part of the landscape. And I suspect that it'll continue to evolve as well. Yep. What's been your escape through all this? What's been the thing where you've been able to, to switch off and not think about football? 
got a couple of great running tracks out the back of the um, the Otway. So just to be able to go out there, run through the hills and um, through a few of the gorges, it's just beautiful. So that's sort of the escape in the mornings and um, train at a few different local ovals. And it's been a, a nice reprieve from sort of the, um, you know, the reality of what everyone's going through at the moment, which, um, which sucks for everyone to be frank, but the, the better we do it, the quicker that we'll be out of it. So that sort of short-term pain, long-term game and allergies, you know, is quite um, apt for the situation we're all in. You've, um, have you got a musical preference? Do you whack the music on while you run or are you a, just a clear thinking runner? How do you operate when you trot off? No, I'm a Bruce Springsteen sort of uh, character, but I have a very weird and eclectic sort of sense of, of music. I listen to um, sort of movie scores at different movies I enjoy. So just real sort of random stuff. <laughs> Go on, give us real random. Give us something that would... You people would go. You wouldn't have thought Patrick Dangerfield was into that. Uh, I like Beethoven. I'm happy to listen to Hans Zimmer. Um, as I said, anything sort of uh, like Beauty and the Beast is a musical. It's got some great tracks on it. So uh, I find that if it's something I can sort of sing in my head to, then it sort of disappears three minutes, and it means I've run three minutes without thinking about how <laughs> steep the incline is or the decline or whatever it might be. So. Um, yeah, that's why I use it. <laughs> um, if you had to take a stab at a date that we're back, um, the earliest we've heard is Eddie has put forward, Eddie Maguire's put forward coming back on Queen's birthday Monday and hopefully getting the big freeze up and running and uh, raising some money for Fight MND. That might be a little bit uh, unrealistic, but uh, is June what you're expecting that we'll be, we'll be playing football at that stage? Uh, oh, for a few for probably a month now, I've sort of, my calculated guess had been around the start of July. Um, but I don't think anyone could have seen, foreseen how well we've all done as a country in terms of flattening that curve. And obviously, when you do relax rules, then it, it will enhance the chances of um, the spread of COVID-19. So that's something to navigate. But yeah, how I see this sort of start of July, but you know, all all signs at the moment are pointing to potentially starting back a little earlier, but it's very much pure speculation from everyone because we still don't know until Scott Morrison and his cabinet and then the, the individual states come out and say, you know, how comfortable they are around with it. And I know that the AFL has been putting in a power of work with them, um, you know, to satisfy the needs of those individual states so we can get um, back up and going and sort of provide a little bit of normality for people where, you know, for a lot, footy is the start of the weekend. That's how they know the week's finished and then they can roll in and, um, you know, just, just follow their team for a couple of hours and be transported away from whatever um, life is throwing at them at the time. Absolutely. We've got you here for another reason as well, because we've been doing some lockdown classics, which I know you're aware of. We played some of the uh, premiership wins, uh, 07, 09, 11. We've gone back to some great games. Um, Zach Tui and his uh, match winner against Melbourne, we played a couple of weeks ago. We caught up with George Hall and Smith last week for his goal against North Melbourne uh, back in 2017. This one's not a classic as in a classic finish, but this is just a great moment in time. Your return to Adelaide, uh, what are your memories of going back there for the first time other than, I think, having people greet you at the airport? Yeah, I couldn't wait for the week to be over. I, I remember the lead up to it, Kevin Dickerson, our media manager, sort of came in and said, how do you want to play it? He said, well, let's just overexpose and then no one will be interested, hopefully, post it. So rather than hide from interviews or what have you, it was the opposite. All right, if anyone wants to talk, let's talk. Happy to talk to them. Um, flood it that week and then hopefully people just uh, are disinterested by the end of it so um, could just get on with a normal season if you will so that was the philosophy so it was, was happy to all in any media throughout that week and the lead up to it uh, which which I did and then um, which the, the club had facilitated and then um, it was a um, an interesting reception um, for some reason, I, I we'd played Port earlier in the year and I'd still been booed. And I just, I just didn't understand. And I'm like, hang on, I left the team that you all despise and you're still booing me? Like, I just... <laughs> it sort of bemused me at the time. And then, uh, yeah, it was an interesting uh, 
reception, but to be honest, it was very much unemotional, go here, get the win and leave. Yep. Are you a really good player at being able to blanket out what's going on beyond the, the white lines? Sometimes. I think you've got to compartmentalise it as much as you possibly can. And I think that certainly helps with professional uh, and elite performance. Um, you know, your mind does wander at different stages, though, especially when you had such a, a long history at Adelaide, um, so many friends there. But to be honest, when you've played with people, when you come up against them, you just want to hammer them. And I think, you know, they're the same. So um, it almost makes you more competitive and more driven to, to you know, play well and win. And um, thankfully, we were able to do that. Is there one player you didn't want to play against? And I know you and Rory Sloan are great mates. Anybody who follows your, your Twitter handle knows that the photo is uh, of you and your Anglesey jumper and, and Rory and his in your club jumper. Is he the player you... play, yep. You up play in the, uh, up in yep. the uh, Ferntree Gully sort of area or the Yarra Rangers. Uh, is he the one that you wanted to not play against? No, I was, I was happy to... I always found, and I've, I've always found, that when I play against people that I know, I get far less nervous. Like, I was never nervous going into that game because you sort of, you understand how each individual player plays, what makes them play well, um, you know, their different strengths and different weaknesses. So I was never too too worried about that. So you sort of know what's coming. It's, it's sort of the unknown on, on, on some players that, that you're sort of more wary and fearful over because you just haven't tracked them as much. So Adelaide obviously knew them really quite well. And I was hell-bent on trying to, very chiefy Lynch and uh, and Josh Jenkins where I possibly could throughout that game um, and any one of the I sort of I suppose my really strong mates I was really keen to try and hit as hard as I could within the rules. Yep. How's Josh Jenkins surviving with no American sport? It's killing him, but the um, I think there's different around the country different trots that are still going. So that sort of um, that keeps him keeps him rolling. <laughs> Patrick, uh, I love talking footy with you. I love talking life with you because I, I reckon you give a, a get a really good balance and I, there might be something to be said for living 45 minutes away from <laughs> But you seem to be able to, uh, to live the life that you want to live, both as a footballer but as, a, as an individual and a family man. And uh, I think you should be commended for that. And uh, we really do appreciate you having a chat to us. Um, we know you've been hammered by the media for a bit uh, to give K-Rock a bit of your time and the Cat Attack podcast. Uh, we really appreciate and we can't wait to see you back playing some footy whenever that may be, but hopefully within the next couple of months. Really appreciate your time, King. I'm looking forward to more bias commentary from the Cats team, uh, the K-Rock team. So, um, yeah, it's my favourite sort of filtered commentary. <laughs> uh, you should hear... I, I'm not sure whether you have, but go back and listen to some of those grand finals and you'll... Get... <laughs> uh, I didn't actually realise there was another team playing. It was great. <laughs> a lot of blokes in blue and white hoops touching the footy. Uh, it's, all, it's exactly how it should be. <laughs> great to talk and uh, we look forward to catching you very soon. Thanks, King. Cheers.